Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study as we look at Lesson 12. We're almost done with the book of Judges. This really is the last lesson concerning real Judges. Uh, kind of ends on a terrible note. We'll kind of get into that in a in a moment. But uh, if I'm looking at it correctly, next week's lesson is on Samuel, where God starts adjusting to the uh, request of the people. Uh, Samuel really didn't want uh, a king. He thought that was a mistake. He thought the Lord should be their king and give them direction. But God said, no, that's not what they really want. Give them what they want. <laughs> be careful what you ask for. You might just get it. And we see that with Saul, the first king of Israel. But we're going to finish up the Judges today, uh, Lesson 12. The title is, How Quickly from Conqueror to Conquered. You know, we've said that the theme of Judges is downward cycle. And so we're going to see it one more time. And it is downward, and the book's going to end on a negative note, which kind of is like, oh, could have been so different. Uh, the study is uh, in Judges 8, 18 through 34. And the actual text of the uh, Bible verse is on page 103 in the regular print version. But um, let's look at the main idea. The reason I do this main idea every week is um, you don't want to get to the place where you get to the end of the lesson and you miss the main point. Uh, and teachers can do that. Um, we as Bible students can do that. You want to make sure that uh, you've read the passage and you kind of get the main point, okay? So that's why I do that. Uh, sometimes you teach a Sunday school lesson and you look back and say, man, I didn't even talk about the stuff that I meant to talk about. So I do that to make sure we talk about the main idea. The main idea this week is how quickly we can slip from victory to defeat. Boy, that's exactly what happened with Gideon's uh, judgeship. Revenge, immorality, spiritual symbolism only, and shifting to our own agenda over God's are fateful mistakes. There's a lot of things can lead to us slipping. Our life is much weightier than our words. You can say one thing and do something else. Basically what the main point was. I like the quick read this week. It says that Gideon began in fear, then began to grow in faith and trust. So, boy, he had some great qualities. There were decisions that he made and things that he did were just so stellar. But his heart moved away from God in the end, and that's heartbreaking. His life became a cautionary tale. So... You know, as I thought about this lesson uh, this week, uh, put several things on paper to kind of introduce the lesson. It, first thing is, uh, the lesson's about Gideon finishing the job of tracking down these two Midianite kings, and he disposed of them. And it's kind of graphic and sad, but uh, he took them out in the end. And that's part of what the, how the lesson begins. Um... I was reading uh, Lucian Coleman, a church buys a little lesson by lesson extra. He was a professor at Southwestern Seminary, he lives in Weatherford now. But uh, he says this lesson is historical, but not inspirational. It kind of tells the end of the story, but it's not something that we want to be like. It's not inspiring. It's inspiring that don't do that, but it's not positive. So... Uh, the lesson centers around the fact that all of us have the potential to backslide into sin no matter where we are spiritually. Let me ask you, have you backslid? Have you fallen back in your faith? I can remember that happening to me as a older teenager, and um, it was frightening. Um, I just basically had to decide what kind of person I was going to be and what I was going to do and not do. And um, I never stopped going to church, but spiritually I was I was doing some things that weren't honoring God. And I'd been doing it for a while. 
and uh, decided this is not good. I got to tell you, part of that was some of my Christian friends confronting me and saying, uh, what's up with you? Why are you doing these things? And um, that helped. <laughs> that was probably the voice of God using my friends. So um, basically Gideon, at the end of his like life, backslid, and uh, it's sad. Um, why does this happen? And what can we do to prevent it? Uh, I kind of have that in my conclusion, uh, truths from the lesson. But I want you to think about why does it happen? And uh, what can we do to prevent it? It's not unpreventable for a Christian uh, to backslide. I mean, um, I've been a minister almost 40 years, and I can't tell you how many people over the years have been faithful, then not. And there's all kinds of reasons for it, but um, it's sad, it's heartbreaking, and many of them did come back, but some didn't. Some became bitter, and uh, that's not God's will. So, this happened to Gideon, and it happened to his nation, to a whole nation. It's one thing for it to happen to one person. It's another thing for it to happen to a whole nation. I guess, you know, I've been in England um, for nine or ten days. Jill and I went, uh, part of my sabbatic leave, and thank the Lord and thank you, church, for allowing me to go. Uh, great trip, very educational, uh, quite a blessing it was. But we went to visit medieval ancient churches of England, and we studied uh, 22, at least, medieval churches. And uh, part of my continuing education to understand the history of the church and all of that. But it's sad, England is a considered a Christian nation. The queen is the head of the Church of England. She represents the church as the head of state and the church. Uh, every week on the BBC, um, people, uh, there's a church service somewhere in the, the nation of England broadcast. And uh, it's a great thing, okay? They consider themselves a Christian nation. But we sat through a church service uh, one night while we were there, and uh, there was a choir singing. I counted 30 people in the choir and 11 people in the audience. And um, for a nation that, that says that it's a Christian nation, only about 3% of people still attend any church in England. And um, they're backslidden. And this is a country that claims to be a Christian nation that used to be one of the great centers of Christianity that's not anymore. Uh, their churches are museums. They're not like a Bible Christian church. Not all of them, but many of the great churches of England are, and it's sad. They backslidden as a nation. Well, let's look at the, the Bible verses today, and I'm not going to read the uh, very first part. Uh, it talks about Zeba and Z Zalmunna. <laughs> These are the Midianite kings that Gideon has been chasing for a few weeks. He finally corners them, and he kills them. He takes them out. But um, they basically kind of taunt him a little bit, and they're not really in the position to do that, but um, they basically have killed some of the family of Gideon, and they taunt him about that. And I'm not sure if they really know that Gideon, that this is Gideon, this is their enemy. You would think that would be hard to not get. But um, part of that also is Gideon asked his son to kill the two kings, and he's fearful, and he's timid. Uh, sounds like his father's son, doesn't it? And uh, Gideon ends up taking his sword out and kills them himself. So... Um, he took the crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels, the gold that was there. And um, the next thing he does is um, he, he talks to his people. And this is in verses, let's see, it's in 
uh, verses 22 through 28. Let me get to the right place in my notes. Um, and basically, the people offer uh, Gideon the position of king, and he doesn't accept it. Let's read it. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us and your son and your grandson also, for you have saved us from the hand of the Midianites. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Which I think is so ironic. That's really was the right thing to do. So he gets kudos. He gets points for that. Good. Good job. Gideon said to them, Let me make a request of you. Every one of you give me the earrings from his spoil. Now, not many people were with Gideon to at the beginning. I guess there were more after that. But the spoils are the spoils of victory. These are riches that they took from those they vanquished. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They wore his earrings. And they answered, We will willingly give them. So they spread a cloth, and every man threw in the earrings of his spoil. And the weight of the golden earrings he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold, besides the crescent ornaments and the pendants and the purple garments worn by the kings of Midian, and besides the collars that were around the necks of the camels. You notice the purple robes, uh, a sign of wealth. And Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city in Ophrah. And all Israel whored after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his people. So Midian was subdued before the people of Israel, and they raised their heads no more. And the land had rest forty years in the day of Gideon. Such an interesting passage here. You know, the first thing I had to ask myself is is it a good thing or a bad thing that Gideon refuses to be king? I think his idea is correct and that God needs to be the king. But in practical sense, would it have been a good thing for is for Gideon to be king? Maybe, maybe not. In the end, you see that his heart isn't whole and his devotion isn't whole. The point is he didn't he didn't accept it. And so um, the people were left to their own choices, their own free will. And in the end, they did not choose wisely and they were not faithful to the Lord. I, I do love the fact that he does understand that God needs to be the king and not him. Uh, that's an argument of Samuel uh, in the next uh, part of the scriptures. Um, why have a king? He was against it. And God told him, no, give the people what they ask for. So his response is positive. You know, as I started reading this lesson and read the title, I started thinking, wow, they're really being hard on Gideon because my first read of the passage was he didn't go build an idol. He went and built an ephod. An ephod is just a breastplate that symbolizes uh, leadership. It was a symbol of God. It was what the high priest used in the temple um, later. Um, how can that be a negative? But it, I had to take a step back and realize anything can be a negative. Really good things can become a negative. So this ephod had become a negative, even though it was kind of a neutral thing. It could be used in a very positive way. And it made me realize that there are a lot of things in life that be can become a negative. Um, <clears throat> you know, providing for your kids and doing things with them on weekends. That's a positive thing. Those are great things, things that we need to do. But if it becomes a, an idol if it becomes more important than having them in the house of God to study his word and to fellowship with other believers, then it's not a good thing. Um, there's a lot of things that are good that aren't great. Um, the great things 
in this life are being a part of godly things with godly people. Uh, those, those good things can take you away from doing the great things that you need to build your life around. So his response was, was great, um, but he built an ephod from these earrings and put it in his city and people hoard after it. It means they they devoted themselves to a symbol of something that took the place of God. And God knew it and and it was it's called out as a negative and it's the beginning of a downward slide in their life. Uh, this ephod is a symbol of God, but it's not God. And we don't need to worship the symbols, we need to worship the person of God. And Gideon uh, and his people uh, didn't. Um, Gideon gets a black eye here also. If you look at the passage, it actually says that um, and all of Israel whored after it there and it became a snare to Gideon and his family. So I was like, well, okay. Gideon is a part of this, and you can't deny it. It's terrible. So, uh, from there, the scripture talks about the end. And I'll, well, I'll read this because it's heartbreaking to me to read. It's the same story about the 15th verse. Jerubal, the son of Joash, Gideon, went and lived in his own house. Now, Gideon had 70 sons, his own offspring, for he had many wives. And his concubine who was in Shechem also bore him a son. Uh, and he called his, his name Abimelech. And Gideon the son of Joash died in, good, in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash's father and Oprah of the as Bizarites. Here's the end. As soon as Gideon died, the people of Israel turned again and whored after the Baals. You see how that that um, term hoard is used second. It's a negative term. We all know that. Uh, but it, it means not being faithful to your mate. And the mate is God. They weren't faithful to God. Um, they hoard after the bells and made Baal beareth their God. Now we're going to talk about that word here in a moment. It's a very evil word. And the people of Israel did not remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hand of all the enemies on every side. So, here they got 40 years of rest, which is whole. 40 is a whole number. They, that In the book of Judges, 40 has been used several times with Judges. But uh, he goes to his house. He lives his life with his family. And um, he died in an old age. And then Israel... Israel goes back to their evil ways. So how much of an impact did his life had have on the nation? At times very positive, but in the end, not so much. Um, you know, I, I, I looked, I had not noticed that word, that second word defining Baal, and that Baal, Berosh, Berith, B E R I T H. I, I looked that up a little bit and it talks about a uh, bell of the covenant or, or covenant Lord. And it has a lot to do with the place of worship, a temple in Shechem. And Shechem is mentioned here. And it's almost a cultic type place of worship. And um, they, they made Baal their God which is evil. And we know that's a fertility God and um, it led Israel down a very evil, evil path that led them into captivity later. Very negative. You wish that the end of the story was different. Well, let's talk about the truths. The first truth is that literally anything can be used to draw us away from God, even good things. We're not saying don't do good things and not participate in good activities. We're saying don't let that become your God and don't let these good things keep you from doing the best things. Okay? 
So take a look at your life and think about uh, that. Second truth is generational sin is difficult to break. And man, we've seen it completely through the book of Judges. One generation after another. That's one of the significance about 40 years. That is a generation. The people of Israel were on uh, in the wilderness for 40 years to let that generation die. So biblically, a generation is 40 years. These are generations of people. This is not the same people that keep sinning. These are different people committing the same sin. That's different. And it's difficult to break. I pray we don't have generational sin in our family. If you do, let's break it. Let's work on it now and be done with it and not let the next generation carry that burden. Third truth is none of us are immune to backsliding. I think Gideon was a great person. There were times he was he was exceptional. Uh, but in the end, he and his family backslid. His life did not uh, end on a good note. And it's important to do that. So none of us are immune. Last thing I thought I'd give you some ideas about it, how to keep from backsliding. I think this, this is my take on it. The best way to keep this from happening in my life is to continue to stay in the Word and study the Bible. To pray. To really pray. Not just sit and listen to somebody else pray, but me to pray. Me to speak to God. To worship. To be a part of worship. To really acknowledge God every day and every week. And to be in church with God's people. Okay? Uh, they need to influence us. We need to be together. So, Make that a part of your life. Let me pray with you. Jesus, we love you. We love each other. I pray that we'd be faithful to the very end. I pray that um, we can learn from other people's bad examples. I pray that our eyes will be focused on you and nothing else. And nothing would be more important than you and your presence in our life. We love you and we trust you. In your name that I pray. Amen. You have a great week. I'll see you next week.